Well, thank you very much indeed, Jan. And, um, thank you, Oliver, and thank you, Kosminski University. Thank you, the Institute for Socioeconomic Inquiry. Uh, thank you to our partner, Media Dialogue for Peace and Democracy, Wolfgang Reisman. And to all of you for being here for this conversation. It was quite daunting when you're asked to give a, a keynote speech, particularly when you know it's just before lunchtime, uh, and also when you know that uh, <laughs> uh, you've got to leave plenty of time for all of you to speak. So I, I really just see this as making a few introductory remarks and trying to sort of animate animate the discussion. But first, let me introduce myself, Roger Casale. It's my name, founder of New Europeans. I was born in, in London, and I was living in London in 2014 at the time of Oira Maidan, actually. I remember uh, speaking at a huge rally in uh, Marble Arch, a huge demonstration at that time. Now I live in Rome, and I live just around the corner from the Russian embassy, actually. And so it, it, I've been also taking part in huge, huge demonstrations across the road, uh, very moving. And a, a reminder of how extensive, delighted to have uh, Ukrainian citizens here as part of our conversation, students at this university, young people, uh, with the same hopes and dreams and aspirations and values as uh, young people across Europe here with us and part of our our, um, of our conversation and our, 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 all our hopes are on your shoulders, no, no, no pressure for, for, for the future. Um, so Jan has said, told us that this is a, <clears throat> kicking off a new stream of work and we're delighted to be involved with that and support it. I should also say that it's the third in a series of round tables the New Europeans and Wolfgang Reisman <clears throat> from Media uh, Dialogue for Peace and Democracy have organised. The first one we had in Strasbourg, it was um, on the same day as the Plenary of the Future of Europe conference was taking place, and that's why we had it there. And I'll come back to that in my remarks, because I think that we're coming to the conclusion of the on the Future of Europe, but I think that uh, we should reflect about that in the context of the war in Ukraine and the future of Europe. And the second one was in Brussels, and um, that was on the day that uh, Joe Friden was in, in Brussels. And um, I say that also because our, uh, we held it at the Brussels Press Club Europe, which is the headquarters of also the headquarters of New Europeans. We weren't sure that we may actually get in to the building or not uh, because of the, uh, the the visit by Joe, Joe Biden. And so I think today it's also for me very poignant because I, I, another of our partners in New Europeans is the Economic Forum, which organizes a conference in car packs each year, and which organizes also the Polish-Ukraine uh, Forum, a huge event which I've been to on a number of occasions. Um, in fact, Thomas and others here with us today may also have been speakers there. And again, it, I, I, this year, this, this was the local government forum I took place in, it took part in, in Mikulashti. And I come to you this morning, I got my transport at seven o'clock this morning from the Syrian lakes, which of course is very close to Kaliningrad and very close to the Belarus uh, border. And so it really makes it very poignant, very close, very close to home, what's happening. And normally when we have the conclusions of these conferences, you'll have some Former politician, by the way, I'm a former politician as well, actually giving some keynote like I'm doing now. And uh, last night we had two, um, two generals and a former head of military intelligence. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's a sign of our times. But their message was that, you know, actually our future is safe with NATO. They think they thought NATO was a, getting um, a little bit long in the tooth, a little bit weak. Uh, and that the American commitment to the security of Europe was somehow uh, in question. Uh, but now uh, they said no, there could be no doubt at all that NATO is solid and that uh, Poland, and, uh, as for Ukraine, well, we can see every day what's, what's going on. So let me just, I thought when I was, I yeah, invited him to speak, how, how to address this, to explain a little bit about what we do at New Europeans and, and why we're, we're interested in this. Because I think it's really three things that we try to do. We try to invite, we're a citizens group, we try to get citizens to connect 
with the, the, the key issues of the day. The second thing then, and, and to connect at an emotional level. Yeah. But then I think the second thing is that we get, we try to create a space in which people can reflect about what's going on. And then I, I think that's what this is about today. And I think the third thing that we do is really um, having an answer to the question, what can I do? What can I do? So I hope that you all can leave with a feeling of, well, you probably know what to do already, you don't need us, but we need to, you, you, can, you can tell us things that other people can do, would be very, very helpful. Now, just on the issue of the emotional connection, I mean, obviously there's a huge wave of uh, emotion in relation to what we're seeing every every day. And we just need to listen to somebody like Lena Kush. I mean, she's got the meeting, she didn't say, the meeting she's gone off to is she's got to brief journalists in Ukraine about how to keep secure in the conflict zones. And as she said, many of these journalists have no experience at all working in conflict zones, and they're putting their lives in danger. That's what she's going to do, so that makes it an extraordinary impact. But, you know, everybody cares about Ukraine today, and rightly so, and uh, look at what's happening in Poland in terms of opening homes and hearts to people. But, you know, it wasn't, you know, if you go back two months, it wasn't really like that. We, we were going to launch a, a big petition to try and get some more support behind the EU-Ukraine association agreement with a platform called Change.org, who we work with. Sometimes they get behind our petitions, we reach a lot of people. They say, hey, Roger, have you got a new idea for a petition? This was at the beginning of Feb end of January, beginning of February. So I said, yeah, let's do, let's do a petition to get some support for you know, Ukraine's relationship with the EU. And they said, they said, no, no, nobody's interested in that. They said, nobody's interested in that. That was, that was in the first week of February, you know, three weeks before the, the Russian invasion. But I think people certainly care about it now. But I think the, the, the really the issue that we want to focus on is, is, is how, how, you know, how, how, what should we make of what's happening? What should we make of what's happening? And, and most importantly, what is it that we can, that we can do? Um, now, you, you might have a look on our website, which is neweuropeans.net, either now or later, and you will see that there are there are three statements. There's, there's a notice about this meeting. There are also three uh, statements on there, which you uh, I would like to draw your attention to. Uh, under the rubric reflecting on what we might what we might do. One is the statement that we uh, put out ourselves uh, immediately after the invasion. Um, and the second one is uh, a, a, a statement that we've associated ourselves with from a group of international human rights lawyers, which is about bringing Putin to account, because of course part of the problem here is that um, uh, Russia had veto on the UN Security Council, and they're also not a signatory to the International Criminal Court. But I think we want to have a sense of, uh, in the end, that we would be held to, to, to account. And the other is the Perugia Declaration from the Perugia Journalist Conference uh, that Lina and Maria have, uh, uh, have referred to. And, um, you know, the famous uh, expression, which uh, some people say goes back to Iskos, who is that, that, that uh, Truth is the first casualty of war, and um, obviously we live in an age of disinformation. And um, this is uh, we, 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 this is why we're so grateful for Lena and Maria Laura's contribution to our, our discussions uh, today. Not just truth, but the journalists themselves, uh, uh, the casualties casualties of, of, of war. It's really really important. It's part of my message to protect journalists. We, we can think about what we could do. We, we, what, if you go onto our website, you'll see a page that says uh, what I can do to help people in Ukraine. And I think one of the things you can do is to have a look at the Media, Peace, Media for Peace and Democracy website and hear the direct voice of people from Ukraine who are first-hand witnesses to what is going on and hear what, what they have to say. So, you know, as Lena said, we're inside the process. It's difficult to be completely objective, but our leaders can trust us. And you can trust what you see on media uh, for Peace and Democracy's uh, website, Facebook page, and you can find the link to that on the New European Stock on the new Europeans.net website. We, we also um, want to give a platform to organisations that are linking up directly citizen to citizen uh, in Ukraine, and there's one young man who's sending medical supplies to the front and so on. And you can find different 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 things there that people can connect with. And if any of you are involved 
with work that is providing direct support, direct help uh, to people or communities in Ukraine. Let us know. We can put that out through our channels and we'll put it out through our partners' channels as well, so that that, I hope, can be something quite helpful. So uh, we need to we need to re re reflect about what, 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 what is going on, what we're, what we're seeing, and we need to have things, uh, we need to have things to do. Um, I talked about uh, NATO. There's, of course, a big push for uh, Ukraine to be part of uh, NATO. Some people will feel that this has been um, uh, what, what um, some, some might see as a, a provocation, although there can be no justification, obviously, for what's going on. And there's also a lot of talk about membership of the European Union for Ukraine. But as David has reminded us in his remarks, um, you know, the, the road to EU membership is a long and hard one. In fact, I can remember as a member of parliament coming to Poland in 2000 to meet the people who were preparing the Polish application to join the European membership, uh, the European Union. And it's a very, very rigorous, very, very rigorous process. <clears throat> but let's remember that there is an existing association agreement between the European Union and Ukraine. And this can be deepened and this can be strengthened and this can be developed. And one of the ways in which New Europeans would like to see this happen is through a strengthening of uh, civil society links and the roles of civil society. And I obviously say that because New Europeans is a civil society organisation. But also, just as we reflect for a moment on who is it who's in the first line, who's in the front line of uh, receiving uh, refugees, four million refugees, I think it is at the moment, into uh, the European Union. Um, who is it that's opening up their homes and making a space and, and giving stuff up to uh, refugees? Um, it's citizens. It's citizens, not the government. It's citizens. Which, who, which are the organisations that are organising to provide uh, support and to meet the enormous challenge of uh, taking care of the needs of refugees? It's NGOs, it's civil society organisations. And probably when governments do get together, which they are doing, they will do, and so on, and they think about what needs to happen uh, to continue to support refugees, to continue to support and eventually to rebuild and reconstruct uh, Ukraine, they will indeed turn to citizens and civil society again to implement the decisions and to spend all, all the money that they make available for that. And it's our view in you Europeans, and I hope you share this view, um, in fact, I hope it's one of, the, one of the things that's brought you to this meeting, that uh, citizens should have a voice in all of this civil society organisations show a voice in all of this. And the voice that needs to be heard at an early stage of the process, not after everything's have gone wrong, turned pear shape, not worked out as they were intended, but from the beginning, because citizens and civil society organisations and NGOs know what to do. I don't say we know what to do, in the Europeans, I don't claim that, but we do know people who do, and we don't, and probably somewhere in this room, and we're all on this conversation. And we, and we do know other organisations that can help. So I think, uh, and perhaps I just bring my remarks to a close with this. I think uh, the challenge for, I mentioned the Conference on the Future of Europe as well, which of course was an exercise by the European Union in trying to learn from citizens and draw from citizens uh, directly uh, from their ideas and their experience about what, need, what needs, to, what's to happen, needs to happen next. So I, I don't want to come here with the message of saying we have to listen to citizens, we have to listen to experts, we have to draw on all the wonderful knowledge and, and ideas that you and energy that you have, and then uh, use up the whole of the time of speaking myself. But that is my that is my key message to you. Thank you so much, Jan, oh, for giving us that uh, opportunity. Thank you, everybody, to be here. I'm so much looking forward to what Owen has to say to us, what all of you have to say to us, and to working with you. Uh, as we really, um, you know, give meaning to our commitment to stand with uh, the people of Ukraine. Um, and I just finish with this, you know, I mentioned how we were told in the first week of February, oh, nobody's interesting, interested in Ukraine, and now of course everybody's interested in Ukraine, and that's good. There will come a day, and it may not be too far away, when people are not terribly interested in Ukraine again, 
And so we also need to keep that in mind. How do we sustain the solidarity? How do we sustain this energy? Because it's going to be needed uh, in the task of rebuilding a free and democratic Ukraine. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.